Our keynote today is John Bracken, who oversees the um, is with the um, the Knight Foundation. John oversees the Knight News Challenge, which is the Knight Foundation's prototype fund, and the Foundation's other journalism and technology investments. He has more than 12 years of experience as a philanthropic investor in digital media, media policy, and innovation, having previously worked at the Ford Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. He was named to Crane's Tech 50 for 2013 and was a 2009 fellow of Leadership Greater Chicago. He serves on the board of the Illinois Humanities Council and he writes at uh, johnbracken.net. We are very pleased and lucky and fortunate to have John Bracken, so please help me welcome John Bracken. Good morning. Um, welcome to Chicago, everyone who's who's visiting us here. Um, it, you know, Chicago usually, I think, at this time of year, we're famous for the futility of of our baseball teams. Um, but increasingly now, um, every week or so, we're becoming more and more renowned for. Um, our public library, the Chicago public, and I, so I would be remiss if I did not tout the fact that yesterday um, our library received another accolade. The IMLS awarded it, or announced it would be awarding it a medal for for innovation. So that's my my hometown Chicagoan plug, which all Chicagoans are required to do at some point during their presentations. Um, and I would urge you, if you get a chance, if you have open time later today or over the weekend to, to check out the one of the branch libraries or the closest one is Harold Washington which is which is down the street uh, about a lovely walk down Michigan Avenue where you can check out things like the makerspace they have there with 3D printers and vinyl cutters and if you're uh, really entrepreneurial you can sneak into the um, the project uh, uh, a, a kind of an innovation session they're doing tomorrow with IDEO. Um, so it, it, I just wanted to partly uh, now now becomes the other part of the Chicago uh, reality, which is nepotism. Uh, my wife works at the library too, so that's part of the reason why I had to I had to uh, I had to make that pitch. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a. I, so Bernie was telling me how impressed he was at how open and. Um, Frank Tom was yesterday in his talk, and I'm going to try to steal some of his courage and, and drink that too, because um, as Bernie suggested, I, I've spent most of my career, uh, you know, 20 some years, thinking about how technology and the internet impacts and can be used by civil, civil institutions, and increasingly I'm worried, and I'm worried that there are disconnects uh, above and beyond technology that are cultural and, and cognitive. Um, and so I'm going to lay out, I, I'm, I don't have a thesis yet, but I'm going to use you guys as an excuse to lay out a couple of ideas and I'd love to get reactions. And, and actually feel free to interrupt me as I'm, I'm going through and I'll try to finish early so we can actually have a, have a discussion. Um, I'll also talk about what Knight Foundation does and specifically about our work to try to bridge between digital innovation and the kind of West Coast startup world and with civil institutions. And for us and for my work, that mostly means things like newsrooms, like the, like the Tribune right here, uh, like government, um, like libraries, um, and, and higher education institutions. And so I'll, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on, on some of our work there. Um, so first, I, I, I want to talk about, I think we're dealing, when we talk about big data, I think there are danger, there are opportunities and there are risks, and I'll also touch on those. And I put, I don't know if I put big data in quotes or whether Bernie put it in quotes when, he, when we started kicking around ideas, um, but um, oh, it didn't come through. That, the, uh, my conversion didn't come through, but this would be uh, someone making the air quotes around big data, uh, if you can imagine the image, because um, I'm less inclined to talk about big data as an entity and more um, partly because I'm trying to do a better job through our work of explaining to real humans what these changes, what the rad, this digital disruption that we're going through, what it means. And when I try to bake that down to the ground level, I end up telling folks, 
don't be intimidated by the notion of big data. Don't be, think about making sense out of information. And, and again, at Knight Foundation, our DNA is in journalism. Um, our background, you know, our founders owned at the time the largest newspaper publishing company in the country. Um, and, and so making, thinking about how to take this, these radical new ideas that are coming forth and translate them and making them real for people is a, is a big part of our work. Um, the other thing I'd say is data is really only half the story. I think that, especially when you think about organizational culture and the way organizations adapt to, to big data and, and new forms of, of making sense about what's going on around us, we lose track of how important culture and people are. We've, uh, one of the areas, maybe we can count how many times I admit failures, one of the areas where we've failed repeatedly is trying to bake in or graph on individuals with specific skill sets, whether it's data analysts or web developers or designers, onto organizations and sort of parachuting them in as fellows or as employees and saying good luck to you and walking away. The projects that we've seen, which I can talk about more later, that have succeeded tend to be more thoughtful, not just about the skills and the talent being brought to the table, but the cultural needs and challenges, right? So um, one thing that we've seen in the news world is taking a, a, a hotshot engineer, developer, and putting, parachuting her or him into a newsroom. Um, that person often gets frustrated, they're alone, they're in a silo, they're sitting in the basement. Reporters come to them and ask them for help, you know, opening, troubleshooting their computer. The projects that we've seen succeed, um, and I'll cite one right now called the Knight Mozilla Fellowship that we do in, in collaboration with Mozilla Foundation, are focused on creating a culture, are focused on um, um, creating support systems and um, um, really kind of take organizing principles and and make sure that people aren't working in isolation but rather have uh, confederates that they can count on, that they can call on when they're when they're feeling uh, isolated within their institutions. And I stole a little I stole one line about this from, from Billy Bean. So Billy Bean is the is the baseball executive that they based the movie on a couple years ago that Brad Pitt was in. Um, and he's renowned for bringing data analysis and quantitative analysis deep into how he runs his baseball team and selects his players. But he, he said that, that there's so much data right now that what's important is the process and what you do with it, right? And the talent you build around it. And so he has been really careful about selecting the, the field managers around him who are able to be adaptable and, and bridge between the players on the ground and traditional baseball thinking and viewing and the scouts and uh, the more the new quantitative based approaches that take advantage of the opportunities we have now for rapid information consumption and analysis. Um, so I couldn't, you know, I, 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 perhaps not by accident, the Leviathan stuck, stuck in my brain. Um, and, and as someone who, who focused on American literature in college, uh, I can't think about Leviathan without thinking about Melville and, and Moby Dick and, and American romanticism. Um, and, and then, of course, Thoreau. Um, um, and, and what American romanticism brings to the table for me is, um, is well, Thoreau's famous quote about, you know, the, the rails, we don't ride, ride, ride on the rails, the rails ride on us, right? Technology does not just serve us, it does not just serve us, but we become slaves to the technology. We all know that partly by how often we're checking our phones and, and responding to the buzzes. I think that that skepticism in that quote about technology and modernization that exists with, that existed in the 19th century in American Romanticism, I think that's a tenet that still runs through um, our work, especially those of us on the civil sector, the civic sector. Um, and so I think that there's a tension between that tenet of American culture and the other more entrepreneurial, capitalist, Carnegie, Mellon, Zuckerberg realm, which is move fast, break things, um, um, don't give a damn about the past, let's focus on the future and what the next hill we're going to climb. And that tension is made manifest in the work we do, and it's a challenge that we have every day. So I, I, um, 
you know, we work with a lot of people starting digital projects. Um, the number of projects, I can think of four projects off the top of my head in our portfolio that are non-profit, three non-profits, one for-profit, all of which are sort of on hold right now because they cannot fire, find um, an engineer who knows how to develop for the iOS, the iPhone mobile system. It's one of the scarcest talents. I, on the other hand, I have friends who have uh, highly funded digital startups who are also having trouble finding those iOS developers. And if those guys are having trouble and they end up hiring high school students who know iOS to come in after school to work on their project, which has been funded by major venture capitalists, what the little digital project of researchers in New York that we fund, their ability to go out and pay $160,000 for an iOS developer to make an iPhone app is, is limited. And so this is one of the challenges I'm wrestling with, is how do we in the civic sector do a better job of whether it's the resources or culture of, of creating adaptabilities and fixes and hacks that would allow us to build the digital tools and products that real humans want and need um, with our limited resources and, and abilities. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of ideas I have around that. Um, so this is another digital entrepreneur. This is a guy named Alexis Ohanian. Um, just out of curiosity, did anyone, has anyone read his book? His book is, um, I think it's Here Comes Everybody. So Alexis is, I think now he's, I'm not sure he's 30 yet, but he's had two successful digital startups, uh, one of which is a, is a news chat site called Reddit, which was pretty revolutionary in the, in the digital media space for enabling uh, readers to engage, active, share stories, and then engage in conversations and vote things up and down. Um, he also, as you can kind of tell from this shot, if you can read those signs, has been really active in trying to protect um, open innovation and, and, and uh, um, fighting back against what he sees as IP restrictions against the open internet and, and the ability to innovate on the internet. But I, I stole one quote from his book, his memoir, his, at 28 he wrote his memoir, um, make something people want or move on. Which is that in Silicon Valley, that's a very non-controversial statement to make, right? I was just at uh, the Y Combinator demo day with 65 companies presented uh, what they'd been working on on the previous 12 weeks. Every one of them talked about their growth and the size of the market that they were trying to address, right? So they were motivated by making something people want or moving on. Now in civil society, that's a much rougher thing to wrestle with, right? If, it is our job as a as a nonprofit news as a journalist, nonprofit or for profit. Journalism traditionally is not necessarily focused on what people. I'm a journalist. I'm doing the Lord's work. I'm going to go out and, and tell the truth and and expose you know these secret emails between a politician and a news organization, um, which is a story that broke yesterday. Um, and how people use it be damned, right? And now in the digital age, when we're all competing with one another and the eyeballs are all able to be counted much more accurately than they were in the past, this becomes much more germane and it's a tough thing to, to wrestle with. And this is one of the cognitive um, humps that we're, I think we need to get over if we're going to continue to have thriving institutions, civic institutions in the digital future. Um, so let me step back and maybe tell you a little bit about what we're doing and maybe how we're trying to address that. Um, so, you know, we're a, a relatively small foundation in the foundation world. I think we're maybe 18th in the U.S. We, um, we fund around $120 million a year and we're focused on two things really at the end of the day. Um, one is, is news and information, journalism. So the Knight brothers were journalists and, uh, and that DNA is in what we do very much. And the second is community. So they own newspapers in cities where they lived. We ha I have colleagues uh, who work deeply in eight different cities across the U.S. As you can see here, Detroit is, is one of them, um, and are engaged with the, the challenges faced by the changing society in, in all the cities. And um, they range in size from Macon, Georgia and Akron, Ohio, to Detroit and San Jose and Philadelphia and Miami. Um, 
I guess I named all of them except for Charlotte and St. Paul. So I, pa Paul, Polly and Susan would be upset if I didn't mention St. Paul and Charlotte. So the, the combination of that work is in part of the appeal and the, I think the value add for Knight Foundation when we get it right is bridging between our work on my team, which is figuring out where is news and information going, where are consumption and use uh, uh, patterns and behaviors emerging in this new world, and not just in Silicon Valley and in New York and in Chicago, but in communities where we have a vested interest like Macon, Georgia and Akron, Ohio. And so at our best, uh, and maybe part of the reason why I, I did try to deflate big data at the outset is um, the majority of our work is rooted in communities like that um, and, and not necessarily just focused on, on the coast. Um, so Bernie mentioned the Night News Challenge, which has been the main arm we've had on the journalism side for, for teasing out new ideas. I want to do my first of a couple of plugs that I'll do is um, we, you can actually go on right now and, and comment and help us evaluate the 56 semifinalists that we're considering uh, for the next week. Um, we're doing a challenge right now with Ford Foundation and with Mozilla Foundation focused on um, the topic that I referred to earlier with that, with uh, the challenge that Alexis Ohanian mentioned, which is that, um, the internet has been such an important platform for innovation, for entrepreneurship, for freedom of expression, for education. Um, and we put out a challenge around asking for ideas for strengthening that, whether it's through content or policy ideas or new products. And if you go to newschallenge.org, you can see the 56 projects that are there. And you can, I encourage you to ask questions of them or leave comments or to vote them up. I don't think you can vote them down. We took that away. That felt mean. Um, but, but this is one of our main, using the challenge format is, uh, has been a cognitive shift for us, right? It's, um, uh, having worked in the foundation world for a while, the found, standard found, it, we, it, there's a, the default historically has been, we have an agenda, let's go out and operate on that agenda and issue an RFP and, and do whatever, you know, collect white papers and, and consume those. Um, we've tried, and it's been frustrating to a lot of people, but we've tried to put out open calls that are slightly issue area focused, but are broad enough to generate ideas that we would never think of. So of the 56 ideas we have up there right now, um, I mean, a couple of them are ideas that I, I think if my team had gotten together, we might have thought of. Probably most of them are not. Most of them are ideas that, um, so for instance, um, New York Public Library has proposed an idea to allow um, children to come in and check out mobile internet cards or, or MiFi spots so they can have library, they can have internet at home. I wouldn't have thought of that if they hadn't proposed it. Um, um, so anyway, so for us, it's become a really important platform for getting our ears to the ground and then building initiatives out of what people tell us that they're interested in. Um, to be, to also to be responsive to how people are building things now, we created a um, what we call a prototype fund, um, and the notion for this is, you know, again trying to trying to. Uh, change up the way foundations and we had normally worked was let's create a process that's fast, that's iterative, that allows us to say yes more often, and let's create a process that rather than, you know, you pitching me an idea and me saying, oh, that's a great idea, let me fund that at scale, let me give you, you know, big money to go build a website and we'll find out whether anyone comes to it, which we had done a lot. Let's create a mechanism so that you can share your idea, you can build a prototype um, and test it. Um, in fact, in the end, we'll bring you into a, a human-centered design training session where it's focused on uh, articulating your assumptions and beginning to set up a process so you can test those assumptions over a period of time, over six months. Um, our, our investment in the prototype fund is $35,000 per project. Um, so a lot of you who are work with big institutions or who might be development officers, I have several friends, you know, $35,000 is, is not necessarily something that you want to apply for. But we're finding that the last uh, quarter call we did, we had over 400 applications for a dozen spots. Um, 
Um, and what we're the other the other element of it that I should emphasize is we expect a failure rate of around 75%. Um, and if it's much lower than that, we're worried that we're not testing wild enough ideas or that we're not the bar the bar is too low. Um, and our expectation, and we're just beginning to do this now, is the projects that come, the 25, the 20 to 25 percent that come through that, that we're excited about, then we double or triple or quadruple down and help bring those projects to scale. Um, um, and I'll do, I'll show you a couple of examples of, of projects that we just, this one is one we announced this week. We announced 17 uh, investments this week in the prototype fund. And uh, again, since I'm in Chicago, I'm going to play to the crowd. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Mikva Challenge, which is a, a really vital um, education and, and kind of youth um, um, engagement effort here in Chicago, um, led by Jed Mikva. Um, so they created, they work with kids in sh throughout Chicago and had their ear to the ground and found that a lot of kids were looking for an easier way to expunge their ju their juvenile criminal records. And um, this, is, this was a really interesting one for us because we've worked in the level of open data and open government data for a while. And one of my frustrations and concerns, again, going back to my big data push, is the open gov space, the language exists at a 30,000 foot level. Um, where those of us who care about it exist, but it doesn't get down to actual real human beings and impacting their real lives. What they're testing here, what the Challenge is testing is, can they create a product that would actually serve the needs of the thousands of kids in Chicago and Cook County who have juvenile criminal records and make it, who are, and there already exist government processes for expunging those records, can they create a digital product that, that makes that more transparent and easier to do? Um, also in Chicago um, is a project called Foodborne, Foodborn. and this is also interesting because it comes out of a collaboration uh, between a project called the Smart Chicago Collaborative, which is based across the street here, and the City of Chicago. So the, the chief uh, data officer at the time in the City of Chicago was, was part of this. And the notion is, if you think you got poisoned by food, let them create an easy form for you to report that to the City of Chicago and they integrate um, Twitter into that. And so it's a, it's a simple web form. You type in where you were, what happened, and it, it gets to the city, and the city can, can check it out or track it otherwise. So that, again, both these are, are trying to take the notions of big data and civic data and open data and boil them down to real human levels. Now, um, this, one's, this one's still early and young, and it might be that as they test out their assumptions, they find that there's not demand for it, or people don't want that, or a website's not what people, how people want to engage with that, and that'll be fine, and we will have invested $35,000 into learning that. Um, um, this one actually seems to be succeeding, so this is actually six months in, um, and so this one will probably live on. Um, so here's the plug number two is, our window is actually open until May 1st for ideas. I think we asked six or seven questions. I urge you to check it out at, at prototypefund.org. Um, I want to cite one project. So as I talk about these challenges of adapting to new ways of consuming information, I want to share one team's experience that we've invested in, um, and actually that I've invested in across two different foundations over the last uh, five or six years, and and I don't know that this is a model, and I'm not sure it's the right path, and I think it might, from a civic perspective, this might be concerning, but I want to share this with you guys, and and because it's, a, it's, it's an interesting one. So I don't know if any of you saw Mapping Main Street. It was a public radio collaboration. You, you might have heard it. Um, and uh, uh, Scott Simon uh, hosted pieces about it on Saturday mornings in 2000, and, Eight or 2000 and, or 2009, you can see from the date stamp here. So what it was is a set of two, two radio reporters and two digital uh, artists, and actually um, Jesse Shapins is a digital archivist uh, from Harvard, uh, hit the road and reported on, I think, uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of main streets across the U.S. And this was, you know, right around the time of the, of the recession. Um, they created a website, they created radio pieces, um, 
and this is a sample. And if you look up Google uh, Mapping Main Street, you can find it. It was great content. Uh, it was really expensive to put together. It was laborious, and it was not sustainable. Um, then this is Kara Oler, who is the, the radio part of that team. Um, we invested in them a couple of years later through a project called Ziga, where they decided what they wanted to do and what they started to do with Mapping Main Street was to encourage other people to put up their photos, record audio, and report what's happening in their Main Street. And I think you can see here, they actually track how many other people have, have reported on Main Street. So they created an organization to try to really blow that out and tease that out, and they called it Ziga. Um, this, is an, this is them actually going through their own uh, design training process. Um, and one of the things they found with Ziga that it was that as a website, it was still really expensive. It was hard to build. It was hard for them to attract um, skilled developers to come work on a nonprofit project. That was one of the lessons that they took away. Um, and so they, um, and this is one of the products actually that came through Ziga, um, which you also might have heard last year on NPR, uh, uh, focused on uh, mixing audio and video and images from people's archives from the, their own experiences at the March on Washington. Um, the short, uh, long story made slightly less long is they decided that to re if they really wanted to make, to enable people to tell stories they needed to shrink the, the footprint and make it and focus on the mobile phone. Second of all, to scale and to build a type of products that are engaging and entertaining and fun to play with, they needed to hire skilled people. And to do that, they could not do that as a nonprofit, and they became a for-profit. They raised venture money, including from our venture fund, because we have our own venture fund. Um, and they now have a, an iPhone app that's been uh, in the in the iTunes store for maybe three or four months now is called Pop. This is a I can't quite show it to you because what it is is it's video enabled and it and it folds off of gifts. Um, NPR is still using the technology actually, interesting enough. So there's for us concerned about how Americans learn about what's going on around them. We you know the fact that this is still a tool that journalists find appealing is helpful. But they've constantly the point is for me is they keep shrinking down the footprint of what they're trying to do, and they abandoned being a nonprofit, right? Their roots were in public radio and, and digital archives, and they abandoned being a nonprofit. So again, I don't, I'm not uh, holding them up as an exemplar. It's one of the projects that we've engaged with over the last few years in their experience. They also, as part of that transformation into the for-profit world, they moved from Cambridge to San Francisco. Uh, which was a big cognitive shift for them and allowed them to hire the types of talent that they, they needed. Um, so I, I also wanted to make sure to talk about uh, you know, some of the negative aspects of, of data and, and open data. Um, so I, I don't know, has anyone heard the phrase doxing? Does the phrase doxing mean anything? So um, um, do you want, to, you want to share your definition? Thank you, my son, my foundation brother. Um, <laughs> hi, Jeff. Um, we, we didn't we didn't plan that. Um, so, sure. So, so basically. Um, it's the act of exposing someone who doesn't want to be exposed using digital tools and exposing them on the internet. Um, and, and so a group of digital hackers recently put out a guide for how to expose police and the personal data of police. So I just grabbed a couple of the, of the sort of lessons they put together. So, you know, go look into the, into the board of registrations, uh, look at the municipal employee list, compare the names with the active voter registration, use Street View to find their homes um, and put together, you know, uh, basically do to them what they're doing to us was one of the phrases there. Um, and then laugh, and then isn't that fun? And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's just, it, it's, um, we're going to see more of this, right? And if our data is out there, people are going to find, this. it's actually not, you know, the, the fact that they exposed it as a big thing was actually surprising to me because these are all pretty easy basic steps that you could do if you really were motivated to do it. Um, 
and I think we'll, you know, I think we'll be seeing more of this in, in, in probably some um, incidents around that going forward. Um, so, so what does this mean? Um, um, I, I think, you know, civic institutions are really important. I guess that's my, that's my thought number one. And thought two is um, we really need to transform in order to remain vital in the digital age, in order to address Alexis Ohanian's demand that we build things that people want. I think for a lot of us, including us in the foundation world, there's a cognitive shift to that and there's, there are cultural aspects to that. And if we want to attract the people who are going to build the types of apps on the phones that we all use, um, we may need new mechanisms, we may need new structures, we may need um, you know, to create cafes in our, in our foundations, um, as, as, as Jeff's colleagues have done at MacArthur Foundation. Um, if we're libraries, we may need to create maker spaces. We may need to create co-working spaces. We may need to figure out how do we more proactively bring entrepreneurs and hackers into our spaces while also thinking about our own internal culture. Um, and I guess there are lots of kind of tips I would say around the, that cultural element. And just one that I would tease out is, is the enabling ourselves to make mistakes, right? The, it, it wasn't easy, but getting the buy-in from my bosses to create a grant-making fund where we're going to fail three times out of four um, um, after previously working at other foundations that will not be named, when they asked at a meeting once when someone said, can you share failures? And I started to share failure and my boss kicked me under the table. Um, um, I think this inculcating this into our institutions is vital. And, and again, I, it's hard, right? I mean, we have hundreds of years going back to the way we think about, you know, how we've constructed our workforce and Taylorism and Fordism and how we've built our workplaces to avoid failure, to build towards perfection. In journalism, it's particularly hard, right? And journalism is all about not making mistakes, right? Um, um, and so, I think there are other kind of cognitive switches that we can wrestle with, but I would put this at the top, at the top of the list. Um, and I'm going to stop there and um, and let you poke back at me or tell me what I'm missing, um, and just have a good discussion if that's okay.